Hello, my name is Tom Hooker, and I'm the pastor here at Summit United Methodist Church. And on behalf of our music director, Rhonda Berlin, and our technical uh, crew of Lori Costello and uh, Cheryl Martucci and Audrey MacArthur, we welcome you to this time of worship together, whether you're here in person or whether you are worshiping with us online. We're just so glad that you're here and that we are together as a community. Today, we're going to continue our series, Called to Be Church, and we are going to be talking today about living in the Spirit and mentoring. We come together to worship God, whose love is revealed in Jesus. The Spirit prompts us to be aware of opportunities God gives us to proclaim good news of God's love through Christ to others. We are called upon to do so in word, Indeed, let us now begin with our worship of God. Let's pause for our centering prayer. We come together, O oh, amazing and ever loving God. We ask, O oh God, that you open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to your direction. Fill us with your spirit, and may we be in tune with your spirit, listening and being aware of how you prompt us to make you known in this world. And so may we help each other to do so through our actions and our words. And may we meet you here at this time to receive your power, Lord, for it is in Christ that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I'd now like to call uh, the attention to our, our children and for a children's message. So um, if you are worshiping online and you have um, some children um, in your household, um, I encourage you to uh, have them um, join us for this children's message. So kids, I have a question for you. Is there a subject in school that is really hard? What's your hardest subject that maybe you have trouble understanding or learning? Maybe it's math, or maybe it's reading, 
You know, there are certain things in our lives that are really hard. And sometimes it takes us a long time to learn them. What else is really hard? Maybe you're taking music lessons. Maybe you're learning to play an instrument. And it's really hard for you. Or how about a sport? Like uh, <clears throat> basketball or baseball. You know, you have to learn to catch and throw. And in basketball, you have to learn to shoot it at the basket. In baseball, you have to learn how to hit this tiny little ball with a really thin stick. It's hard. And the only way you can learn it is by practicing. But even when you practice, sometimes it's really hard. <clears throat> how about reading, <clears throat> excuse me, reading and understanding the Bible? Sometimes that's hard, too. We adults have, have difficulties with that, too. So what is it that you need to do, then, if something is really hard? What are your choices? Well, it, do, you, um, <clears throat> do you just give up and walk away and say, forget it, I can't do this? No, of course not. What is it that you need to do, then? You need to ask for help. And there are a lot of people around to help you. There are, of course, your parents and your grandparents. Maybe even a brother or sister can help you. Can help you learn that subject in school or help you with that music lesson or to learn a sport or even to read and understand the Bible. <clears throat> Even we adults need to learn things. And sometimes we have people to help us. If you're learning a sport, for example, you might have a coach to help you learn it. You see, we all need help with certain things. And we need to learn how to, to ask for help, too. In church, you have Sunday school teachers that might be helping you. Or other members of the congregation. Or maybe even your pastor. There's a story in the Bible that we're going to read in a few moments about a man named Philip and how <clears throat> he meets another man from another country. And the, the other man from the other country, country is trying to read the Bible and understand it, and he can't. And so he asks Philip for help. And when Philip helps him, this man from this other country is able to understand, and that, because he understands, <clears throat> excuse me, is able to get closer to God. And I want <clears throat> to show you what I mean by that, <clears throat> because we all need help in getting closer to God. I have here a glass of water, half a glass of water. Okay. <clears throat> And here I have an egg. You will understand in a few moments why it's marked like this. But I have an egg. And I'm going to put this egg in the water. Now watch what happens with the egg. The egg is like, that's you. That's us. We're the egg. And when we are trying to learn something, trying to read and understand the Bible, for example, Sometimes it's really hard, and we feel like we're sinking. We feel like we're not getting anywhere, and we're not getting closer to God. But here's what happens when we come together <clears throat> as a com what we call a community of faith or the congregation. Tape this so it wouldn't spill on my way here. Now I can't get the tape off. All right. So I don't have fingernails.
Okay, so what's going to happen is this salt is, um, represents, there we go, this salt represents the community or the congregation, all the people that can help us, people in the congregation, pastors, Sunday school teachers, parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, everyone that can help us. And when we get that help, when we come together as a church, as a congregation, and it takes lots of us, watch what happens. Now, the adults will probably know what's going to happen here. But it takes lots of us. I don't know if you can see it, but the egg is starting to rise to the top. We're getting closer and closer to God. We're getting closer. If you watch the red, there, there, see? Now, we got closer to God because all of us helped each other. And that helps us all to get closer to God. And if you can't see it, let me just put this spoon right at the top here and pull up the egg. Okay? Let's pray. Gracious and ever-loving God, thank you so much for the church, for all the people in the church to help us to get closer to you. We know, God, that without all those people, without our parents and our grandparents and our brothers and sisters and Sunday school teachers and all the people in the congregation, we know that it would be so difficult for us to get close to you. And so we need them. We all need each other. So thank you for them, Lord, and help us to always ask for the help that we need so that we can indeed get closer to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> As we continue our series called to be church and as we're studying how the church in the early church in the first century uh, came about we read from acts chapter 8 26 through 40 this is philip this is about philip and his encounter with the ethiopian eunuch then an angel of the lord said to philip get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, 
queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before its shear. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at <clears throat> Azotus. And as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of God for the people of God. So today, I want to talk a little bit about living in the spirit and how we need to mentor each other to be able to do that. Living in the spirit is like a child learning to swim. Now, there are a number of ways that can come about. There are a number of ways that the child can respond. For example, you have the child who, when the parent is standing in the water with outstretched arms waiting for the child to jump in and encouraging and coaxing the child to just jump in, and the adult assures the child that he or she will catch the child. But the child is afraid and says, no, no, I can't. I don't want to. And the child just refuses to budge because the child does not want to leave his or her comfort zone, which is on dry land at this point. Another way that that can come about is the child can kind of just sit on the edge of the, the pool with feet dangling in the water, splashing a little bit, and thinking that that's swimming. See, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Just testing the waters a little bit, but not ready to jump in and not ready to take the hand of the adult to lead that child through the pool. On the other hand, there's a child that just jumps into the outstretched arms of the adult, and the adult leads that child along the way through the water. If you're a, a parent and you have had children and you've tried to teach children to swim, you've probably experienced one or all of these three scenarios. Living in the spirit is like that. 
some people, even though they hear the promptings of the Spirit, do not want to budge because they do not want to leave their comfort zone. They want to stay with their feet firmly planted on the ground, doing what they know how to do and not taking any risks. On the other hand, there are some who will try it just a little bit, dangling their feet in a little bit and thinking that that is living in the spirit. But they don't realize how much they are really missing. And then there are those that are willing to jump in, even if it takes a risk, knowing that God is there to catch them, that God, God has gone before them into the waters, and God is there to catch them and lead them along the way. But there's a fourth scenario with a child jumping into water. Sometimes a child just doesn't want to jump in, but if there is someone else there to show them how it's done, to model it for them, say another child, maybe an older child, a brother or a sister or a friend, and that older child, see, look, this is how we do it, and then jumps into the outstretched arms of the adult. See, if I can do it, you can do it. And sometimes that works. Another way it works is if the other child takes the hand of the one who is fearful and says, come on, let's do this together. And maybe that makes it a little bit more appealing. Maybe that gives the, the, the child that is afraid a little more, bit more comfort. And they do it together and they jump in to the outstretched arms of the adult or adults. Living in the spirit is like that too. Sometimes we need others to take our hand, to jump in with us. We need mentors. All of us need them. You know, we need help on this Christian walk. And God has provided that help. God has provided you. We are here for each other to guide us along the way, to listen to the promptings, to encourage one another, and to step out in faith. No matter where you are, whether you're a seeker like the Ethiopian eunuch or a veteran like Philip, whether you're laity or clergy, whether you're younger or older, whether you're an insider or an outsider, no matter who you are, you need help. We all need help. We need each other. We need mentors in faith. You know, there are all kinds of mentors. Every, I think every profession probably has a mentor or an apprenticeship of some sort. In the business world, we had mentors. When I first went into management, I had a mentor. As clergy, we have mentors to help us along the way. Even young parents need mentors. They need a more experienced parent to maybe help them along the way. In all different walks of life, we need people that we can look up to, that we can seek assistance from. And in the same way, we need to be those mentors for other people if we have the experience. Mentors listen, and they help us to respond in the appropriate way. Mentors are, help us to adapt when things change, and mentors hold us accountable for doing things the right way. And they do so without being judgmental. They do so in a loving way. Mentors are willing to jump in with us and walk alongside of us. In Acts, they had mentors. The Ethiopian eunuch had a mentor named Philip. 
Philip had mentors. He had the apostles. The apostles had a mentor named Jesus. These mentors helped guide them. They helped them to listen appropriately to the Spirit. And then helped them to respond and maintain their faithfulness. Mentors held them all accountable. You know, throughout Israel's history, though, they had had a problem with this. They had a problem in listening to God. Too often they turned their backs on God and they went their own way. They were too easily distracted from what God wanted them to do and too easily distracted from listening to God because they had their own agendas. They had their own personal desires, what they wanted to do. And so as a result, they turned their backs on God. You know, last week we talked about how <clears throat> the church, the early church, had to select some servants to delegate and spread out the responsibilities of being the church. And among those selected were Stephen and Philip. Now, Stephen was brought before the council, the Jewish council, and he was questioned on why he was doing what he was doing, why he was talking about Jesus so much, and why <clears throat> he was stirring the pot, why he was going against the grain of all the laws of Israel, all the Old Testament laws. Now, Philip, in his defense, started to to give them a summary of Israel's history, reminding them of what happened from Abraham's call to, to Moses' call, from, from Moses leading the people in the desert through the wilderness to Joshua. In each of these cases, the people didn't listen to God. They had their own ideas and their own ways, and they turned their backs on God because God wasn't responding the way that they expected. And so they tried to do things on their own, and they were unsuccessful. And then Stephen further reminds them of, of, of King David all the way through the prophets and how people were continuously warned to turn back to God. They were provided with mentors, but they didn't take advantage of it. Instead, they went their own way. And the point I think that Stephen was trying to make was that the church of Jesus, this new church, this new community of faith, is not going to be that way. We are going to be there for each other and for others on the outside. And we are going to mentor each other in faith and help each other get closer to God. Now, ultimately, if you know the story, you know that Stephen was, was uh, taken captive and he was murdered. And so these constant threats by the Jewish authorities caused the disciples to scatter. And some of them ended up in Gentile territory, particularly Samaria, where Philip ended up. And here they continued to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. So here is Philip in this non-Jewish territory and Gentile territory doing this work of evangelizing, spreading the good news when he hears a prompting from the Holy Spirit, actually in the guise of an angel. And he is told that he needs to leave, what he, let go of what he's doing and go on the wilderness road. In other words, go off the beaten path. Go out of your comfort zone. And there you will find what God wants you to do. Now, I can, I can only imagine Philip, and he must be wondering, what is God up to now? What do you want me to do? You want me to go where? Why? It makes no sense. I'm doing good work here. How long is this going to take? 
I'm right in the middle of doing the work that you called me to do here. But Philip responded. You know, so often we don't listen to the Spirit. It's not that we don't hear the Spirit, but we don't listen because we don't want to re- or we don't respond because it's out of our comfort zone. It's taking us in a new direction. It's doing something different. And we don't like to do that. So we don't listen. We don't respond. But Philip does. And when he does, he encounters this Ethiopian eunuch. Now, this was really different. First of all, a Gentile, another Gentile. Not only that, but he was from a totally different culture. And here was someone who had no sexual identity. Someone who was also well-to-do as the secretary of the treasury for the queen of Ethiopia. He traveled in style. And Philip was called to mentor this person. He hears the spirit telling him to go to this man, and he goes to this man's chariot and hears him reading the scriptures. But Philip understands that his purpose is to help this person, to help the person understand the scriptures and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so he does. And due to Philip's mentorship, this Ethiopian's life was changed. He found new possibilities for his own life. And he went away rejoicing in this new life. You see, I think the challenge for us today is to consider who we need to sit beside and help guide. Maybe it's a foreigner. Maybe it's somebody that's totally different than we are. Is that going to stop us? I pray not. Or maybe it's someone who we know. Maybe it's someone in our own congregation who needs some additional guidance, who needs some help in getting closer to God. We all need help being closer to God. Mentors help us to do that. They help us to live in the Spirit. They help us to understand the promptings of the Spirit and be able to respond and be accountable to that. We all need them. Mentors can be spiritual directors. They can be coach, coaches. They can, mentors can take the form of covenant groups or prayer partners. Mentors can take the form of spouses and friends, congregation members, colleagues. I've had mentors throughout my journey. Right now, I have a... a a clergy coach who helps me, who I meet with once a month, who helps me with the leadership of the church and helps me to interpret the spiritual direction, the calling of what God wants me to do here at Summit Church. I have clergy colleagues who I meet with once a month, or I used to meet with once a month prior to pandemic, and we're hoping to get back together real soon. But we share about ministry, and we share about some of the struggles, some of the joys, and how we, and we help each other interpret how God is leading us. I've had covenant groups. A covenant group helped me to discern the call into ministry in the first place. And a covenant group helped guide me through seminary. We all need coaches, no matter who we are. I'm a member of the District Committee on Ministry, and our task is to uh, interview candidates for ministry and to recommend them for ministry, and also to interview local pastors on a, year, on a yearly basis 
and recommend them to continue to be able to be local pastors. And one of the things we require of all candidates and local pastors is to have a mentor, to have another clergy person who is more experienced to help them in their leadership, in developing their pastoral skills, help them to listen and to respond to how God is calling them in the leadership of their church, to help them to live in the spirit. And what I suggest is that we all need that here too, within the congregation. We all need mentors to help us live in the spirit. You know, when I read this passage and it's talking about the spirit, we're not talking about an emotional or ecstatic experience that we sometimes associate with the spirit. No, we're talking about a guiding force behind the church's mission. The guiding force that takes the church across the barriers that the world puts up for us. A guiding force that helps that helps to, to guide us and correct us and empower us to do the work that God has called us to. I think this is fully related to our mission as a church. And therefore, each of us needs to have those people who are going to guide us along the way to help us be the community that God calls us to be. Mentors help lead us beyond our own agendas and help us to focus more on God's agenda. Mentors lead us out of those comfort zones. Mentors lead us away from standing on that even solid ground or lead us away from just kind of dipping our toes in the water. Mentors encourage us to go all in and they help us to do so. They help us to go into the unknown, to go into that wilderness. For that, we need each other. So if we, as a community, are to live in the Spirit, if we are to be in tune with the Spirit, I think, I think it begins with each of us living in the Spirit and being in tune with the Spirit, and for that, we need to help each other whether it's through one-on-one mentorship or through being together in a small group like a covenant group. We all need it. I'm convinced we all need it. So, my question to you is will you find someone to walk alongside you, to help guide you, And are you willing to be the one who helps guide someone else and walks alongside of them? Who will be your mentor? Who will walk alongside of you and help you to live in the spirit? And who are you going to mentor? Who are you going to walk alongside and help live in the spirit? Amen. Let us now go into a time of prayer. O gracious and ever-loving God, we come here at this time to, to praise you, to praise you for who you are and who you have made us to be, and to thank you to thank you for our lives, for our eternal lives and our lives here on earth that call us to be your instruments of grace and peace. And so we give you thanks, Lord, most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, and the power of your spirit in which we can live to be drawn ever closer to you. We acknowledge, Lord, that there are times 
when we want to just go our own way, and we indeed do so many times. We don't respond because it takes us out of our comfort zones. And so we ask that in those situations that you might provide us with the help that we need, with the people that would help us to take that leap so that we might fully experience your power. Help us, O Lord, to place our full trust in you. We also know, God, that we live in a, in a broken and hurting world. There is so much pain in this world. And perhaps there is pain in many of our lives, but we also know that we are your instruments of grace and peace to bring healing. We pray specifically, Lord, for, for the children, for those children that are unaccompanied, that are migrants brought here to, to this community and then sent somewhere else again, we can't even imagine how they must be feeling and what they must be going through. So we pray for them, O oh God. And we pray for healing for them, for them to receive the support, the compassion, the love, and the care that they so desperately need. And we pray, God, for people who are grieving, people who are still struggling with this pandemic. We pray for your strength. And we pray, God, that in the midst of it all, we as individuals and as a congregation and keep our full faith and trust in you. Guide us according to your ways, O oh Lord. Help us to let go of our own agendas and to follow your ways so that we might fully experience who you want us to be as a church, as disciples, and as your people. And so we pray all of this in the matchless and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Spirit like a t-
we have the privilege of responding to God in a number of ways. Um, many of you have already um, <clears throat> donated items, new clothes and games and toys for these displaced uh, children that were brought to, um, to Erie, specifically to, to our own community of Summit here. Um, and if you've heard the news or you received the emails yesterday, um, they have suddenly been uh, transported somewhere else in the country. We don't know why. We don't have any further details. So first of all, I want to thank you for uh, making those contributions and, and going out of your way to, to do that. And we will hold on to them for a while because there may be more children coming here. We don't know that. And if not, if after a few weeks that is not the case, um, uh, we can certainly give those uh, to to other organizations within um, the the county of Erie that will that are in need of that. So thank you for participating in that, and um, uh, we pray for those children, no matter where uh, they have gone. We pray for their safety and for their well-being. Um, you can also respond by, um, as we have done the last couple of weeks, uh, filling out these um, cards. Uh, as you offer yourselves and answer the question, how am I offering myself to God uh, for this community, helping this community? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, how will I work with and within the congregation to do God's work? And here, I just want to give you a few samples of, of ones that we have received. These are all anonymous. One is to be more connected with the members of the congregation. I will help the children who are recent refugees. I will restart the small group that gathered for the study of the story. I will pray for the leadership of this church. I commit to purchasing something for EUMA or the Summit Food Pantry each time I go to the store for the rest of this year. I plan to explore the possibility of volunteering to help with the immigrant children here in Erie. They certainly need to feel God's love. Showing love and caring to everyone as Jesus does for us. Help others and lead them to God. I like to make phone calls to friends that I haven't seen during the pandemic also to help a family maintain their household. So you can see there are a number of ways in which you can offer yourself to work with and within the congregation to help us to be the people of God. And so if you have not had a chance to do so, I encourage you. There should be additional cards back there. Um, you can fill these out and place them in the, in the basket that is located at the entry exit uh, of this sanctuary. And if you are online... Uh, please feel free to send those to us. You can either email it or use the prayer portal in the church app and send those to us. And we would um, um, hopefully, I, I hope to make a list of these so that uh, you can see how we are committing ourselves and offering ourselves to God and to this community of faith. And finally, of course, we can uh, offer our tithes and offerings to help the work of this congregation, to help us to be the people of God as we serve the community and as we make a difference in the world. And we can do so in a number of ways, either electronically through the church app or through the church website, or we can do so by mailing in our offerings to the church office or depositing them in the offering plate that is located at the entry exit to this uh, worship space. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the many gifts that you have given each of us. We thank you for the ways in which you have, are using us to further your kingdom. And so now as we offer ourselves and as we offer these tithes and offerings to you, we pray, O oh God, that they might indeed make a change in this community of faith, in the community in which we live, and in this world so that you may be honored and you may be glorified. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us uh, for worship.
And uh, I hope you'll join us next week as we continue our study of Call to Be the Church. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about being a church in a multicultural world. And um, so I hope you will join us either uh, in person at 8.15 or 9.30 uh, through reservations, please. Or you can watch us online. You can worship with us live at 8.15 or you can worship with us thereafter on Facebook, YouTube, or the church app. I hope you'll join us. And now, remember, we never leave a place of worship, but instead we are sent out into the world to be and do for others what Jesus Christ has been and done for us. Let us go and do so now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.